All right, well, we're recording. We are live. Welcome to the next installment. Oh, look at that. Hey. Little, 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 little Wally, my wife, Leah. Uh, next installment of Mr. Messner's Math Speaker Series. I have with me two lovely people, uh, one of which goes all the way back to CYO basketball days. I don't right. even know if, if CYO basketball exists here in Texas, uh, but... Uh, we were basketball teammates throughout. We had probably one of the most memorable seasons, freshman year basketball. Uh, great stories coming from there. Kept in touch since then. And then his lovely partner, this is Kate. Uh, so Michael and Kate, Michael Milchark, Kate Mahoney, uh, they were married how many years ago now? Five, seven? Uh, you know, two and a half. Two and a half. <laughs> it just feels like five. Time flies, guys. Time flies. <laughs> Uh, so say hi to everybody, Michael and Kate. Uh, where are you video chatting from? We are video chatting from um, technically New Providence, but Summit right on the border, New Jersey. How about New that? Jersey, <laughs> close to where we grew up in Summit, New yep. Jersey. Fantastic. Um, can you tell us uh, what you guys do for a living and uh, where, where you work, what company you work for? Go okay, um, I'll start. I am a youth services librarian in a public library. Um, my library is Riverdale Public Library in Riverdale, New Jersey, which is about, on a good day, 30 minutes from here, north. Um, cool. Yeah. And um, would you like me to go into it a little <laughs> more? I mean... No, just where, where are you working and what do you do? So, uh, librarian, uh, youth services librarian. Public library, youth services. Michael? And I work at uh, Morgan Stanley Wealth Management uh, in the technology division, doing project management, uh, also Scrum Master and the new Agile kind of framework. Fantastic. So very different occupations. We have uh, financial services. It seems like, uh, Michael, does that mean you are, are you working with clients, with individuals, or are you working more on the back end of Morgan Stanley's side of things? Tell me, right. tell me more about your job. Yeah, so it's more the back back services, right? So our clients are really the financial advisors uh, who are out in the field, but there's certain parts of our organization that also serve the clients with like the mobile uh, app, the website that they go to to log in and see their account info. So it really depends on which team you're on. So it's really anyone who interacts both in Morgan Stanley and outside of Morgan Stanley with wealth management. That we serve. And that means you probably work in New York City. Is that correct, Michael? I did up until about a month ago. <laughs> Right. Commuting uh, in and out since uh, yeah, since graduating college, and we used to take the train together too. Yeah, we did. Uh, <laughs> now, are you going to be permanently now from home, or uh, yes, yeah, still up in the air. Um, where everyone's working remotely indefinitely right now, while things kind of figure things themselves out. They don't want to put anyone at risk or bring anyone into the office that doesn't need to be there. Um, so yeah, we're just figuring it out as it goes for now. But I'm sure this will reevaluate the whole working in an office versus working remotely uh, priority for the firm as a whole. So, Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, well, can you guys walk me through like where you went to college and what path you took to get to where you are today? Like other previous jobs that you had. So uh, whoever wants to start. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll start again. Um, so college, I went to Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, I thought I was going to study history and like do like a pre-law kind, of, kind of thing and then find myself majoring in political science and then I did an internship um, at Poets House between my junior and senior years. Yes, between junior and senior year. I don't know if you've heard of Poets House. Um, it's a poetry library in Battery Park City in Manhattan cool. and I realized, whoa, I think this is where I need to be. I think I need to be in libraries. I like being around books. I like being around people who like but appreciate books. And uh, we didn't lend out material at Poets House. Um, and I did a lot of video editing actually, because they did poetry events and they liked stuff uploaded to the website. So I did a lot of like computer techie stuff, like not serious techie, but some yeah. tech stuff that I realized no, still the library is the setting I want to be in. So I applied to grad school my fall of my senior year um, for a master's in library science. Got accepted to Rutgers. So I came back home after graduation, commuted to Rutgers, and after two years got my master's in information, library and information science. And um, 
worked part-time at my hometown public library. Then once I got my degree, asked if I could be sort of bumped up to like a higher paying role. Mm -hmm. So they gave proper, me, proper I had been in circulation in the children's department. I asked if I could get a raise, get a promotion. So they moved me over to adult reference and I got a part-time job in at Denville Public Library, also in North Jersey, doing children's services. Um, and to backtrack a little, I thought in grad school, because I have a history bent, that, oh, I want to become an archivist. This is really exciting. I want to work with like old documents, like not just books now. I'm like, I want to become the person who gets to look at like old letters and personal papers of famous old people. Sure. And I couldn't land a job. I couldn't land an internship after getting the master's while focusing on that. So I fell back into the public libraries and oh. part-time jobs came in and then took a while, took a while, finally got my current role um, doing full-time children's services at Riverdale Public Library. I'm sure there's not that much turnover in the library world. It's like, once you get a job you like, you're staying there forever because you love what you do. And it's like, yeah, you're just going to stick with it. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I see some turnover with children's positions, like a lot of young people start in the roles and then move up to like, Being educated. Uh, a lot of people want to become directors, I think. Gotcha. Yeah. They have public libraries. I like where I am though, because awesome. yeah, really hands on. What about you? What, what was your path? So I went to the New Jersey Institute of Technology, um, where I majored in information systems, which is a bit of a hybrid of computer science and business. So kind of that in-between point, um, I kind of, it turned out to be more of a project management degree also, which was perfect because that's what I ended up doing and have been doing since I graduated. Um, I interned for two summers for Citibank um, and then ended up in their global wealth management associate program. Um, was there for years. Um, Morgan Stanley during the last recession bought my division of Citigroup. So we all moved over to the Morgan Stanley uh, company. I never left. It was just kind of transitioned over. And that's where I've been all these years. It's been a blast, but we've always had been really lucky to every two or three years, something like our company being bought out or my group of division getting split up and broken up. I've been able to jump every two or three years to a different role and learn something new uh, every couple, few years. So it's been really interesting and never really getting bogged down or bored. I feel like I'm doing the same thing every day for years and years and years. So it's always a pretty new experience. And We've now, uh, well, last year we bought uh, Solium, which is a, won't go into too many details, but I'm working on the team to help merge that data into our existing platform. So another new exciting challenge. <laughs> I think we've heard from a lot of different speakers that said like, you know, you start with one thing and then all of a sudden it, it takes <clears throat> different places, you know, and for both yeah. of you guys, it's like a lot of, a lot of my students think they know what they want to do right now, but uh, that's okay to think you know what <laughs> Do, but you might end up with something some somewhere else and just life takes you different places well um, yeah i mean and down that path because i heard what you were talking about with maddie i mean i was the kid in junior year of high school where i was spending two to three days a week in the guidance office just pouring through college books career books trying to figure out what i wanted to do so i was very mm -hmm. focused on what i wanted to do i purposely went to the school i went to to focus on the major they had uh, back when i was going most schools information systems would be ironically was either a library degree or what I was looking for, but it wasn't a widespread degree that you could find. So the options were kind of limited. So while I knew what I wanted to do and I'm doing what I wanted to do, it's changed all the time. So it's, I think really, it's really great advice to, to tell students. It's like, go yeah. ahead and do lots of research and don't just go to a school just because it's a big name. You know, yeah. a lesson I, don't, I wish I learned, which was like, make sure you go into all the degrees because you know, in hindsight, I probably would have gone to a big school and gotten an education minor or get, gotten something uh, education-wise uh, my first time around instead of having to focus on education my second time around. So yeah, very there's very good, very good stuff coming out. And, and, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to throw in a funny thing. Yeah. Um, when I landed my first part-time children's librarian job, in the interview, I was told, "So you're going to have to do story times. You're going to have to sing." With, with <laughs> And I said, oh, no, I can't, I can't sing. I can't do that. And my ultimate boss said, well, then this isn't the, you can't take the job. 
this yeah. isn't for you. And I said, okay, well, let me rethink. I think I could do that. <laughs> All right. If I got to sing with toddlers, I got to sing with toddlers. Yeah, your comfort zones have to be pushed throughout the process. Uh, that's, that's a great example of it. Um, Let's talk about math now. So like, what kind of math do you guys do uh, in your jobs? What does math look like on a daily basis in your careers? Go ahead. I'll go first, because I'll be pretty quick. Um, there isn't a ton of math in my job. I'm just gonna be honest. But um, I have been thinking about how I get to do very basic foundational math. Like if you really think about when does math start, maybe? Probably starts with counting when you're a toddler or a preschooler and I actually, feel pretty proud of the fact that I can <laughs> get that initial, I don't know, bit of math to the youngest people. Cause we, when you think about when you do a story time and you do a counting rhyme, you're just showing your finger up on the screen like I'm doing now cause I'm doing virtual story times. <laughs> um, I think that's actually at the very basic level, the start of math. It's, and, still, um, math. it's still math and you're still using math. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm always seeing the kids, you know, okay, now, you know, one monkey fell off the bed, so how many are left? And that's, that's the direction <laughs> right there. A question than you think it would be for these young kids. My, my right. daughter, uh, you know, it really takes a lot of time, and you can't push and just assume that they're going to figure it out. No, that's great. That's great. And Mike, what about you? I was going to say one more thing. And I do, I didn't get a lot of statistics in my math education. I'm sure we'll get to that later. But I do use spreadsheets. Um, and I was pleased for myself a couple summers ago because I like to keep we have to keep track of a lot of statistics in the library um, I was able to do side-by-side -side comparisons of participation rates in over the course of one summer versus another summer and you can see based on the numbers we kept for how many books kids read um, you know things had gone up things had gone down and you can see the percentages and it was a great way to side-by-side -side compare our successes or not so many successes in a quali yeah, qualitative way or quantitative, yeah, quantitative way. way. Yeah, well, it seems like even though you're like a librarian and you said yourself, you don't use math, that is like math and data analysis. It seems like every single person I've been talking to ends up using a spreadsheet and doing some sort of data analysis. So that's, there you go. Like, even if you think you're not gonna use it at all, you're, you're ended up using it. Right. Uh, Mike, what about you? Yeah, so I mean, similar to not as heavy as Maddie, but um, I mean, spreadsheets are, are a lot of what we use at work. Um, I do a lot of PowerPoints as well. Um, it really depends, like I mentioned, which group I'm in at the moment in time about how heavy math is related. So if you're using, if you're on a team that's developing user interfaces for clients or for the financial advisors, you're not doing much math. It's more design and getting kind of the best picture out there, so to speak. Um, my last few roles, including my current one, are very data-driven teams. So how many clients have this kind of scenario? How many have this one in pouring through data sets and trying to pull out um, patterns that you see, seeing where the issues are, and even just going through data and finding things that don't make sense. So if you have a whole list of clients with phone numbers and some of the fields have letters in them, obviously we have a problem there. So it's doing that kind of both statistical analysis, but also the data analysis also to pull out patterns, pull out issues and kind of figure out why that happened and how do we address them or prevent them from happening in the future as well. Now, where did you guys learn how to do this? All this spreadsheet data analysis? Um, you know, did you, did you learn this in college? Did you learn it on the job? Uh, where did all, where did the, the knowledge come from for you guys to do all that you're doing? I'm kind of self-teaching on the job. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I I did take, um, for my political science major, we had to take poli-sci political science research methods, but I didn't, we didn't really get into spreadsheeting and yeah, I've been learning as I go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So ironically, Maddie and I both started at Citigroup in buildings that were literally connected to each other in Manhattan. So even though we didn't see that often, but so in Maddie's division, they had those kind of pre-courses that he talked about. We didn't really have much of that. So similar to Kate, it was more learning on the fly, learning from coworkers. And to this day, I have questions about how um, queries they've set up or the functions they use in Excel. And it's always a big teachable environment because we're all trying to help each other figure things out on our own, but also be able to do it going forward on our own as well. And then we just continue handing that down as we go through. But um, I think 
I don't, while we may not explicitly, I and mean, we get to the calculus question later, um, NGIT being originally the Newark College of Engineering, it's still a very, at least when I was there, very engineering heavy school. So there was no major you could take there without taking calculus. At least even the business degrees had to take calculus one. Um, I got a Bachelor of Arts. I went all the way to Calculus 3, and I still didn't get a Bachelor of Science. You needed to go to Calc 4 to get a BS, which <laughs> it's how it got. I was done at 3. <laughs> but I, while we may not have been using the things we learned there, I think the critical thinking skills is what they really taught us. Um, we only were able to use basic calculators. The numbers were always simple enough. You could do it with a pen, uh, pencil and paper. So it's really just working through problems, building up the confidence to know when you meet something that you don't know, well, you could fall back on, I figured things out before. So if I take this down and pull it down to, into pieces, let me figure it out along the way kind of a thing. So that's a good perspective on things. And, uh, and yeah, tell me about your experience, both of you guys with like math in high school and college. Like, what, did you think you were a great math student? Where did you end up with math? Like your senior year of high school, where did you get to math in college? You say calculus, stop to calculus three, we said we took maybe a statistics course. Yeah, go into like, how, what was your experience with math? Um, I'm gonna go back a little farther because I had a fabulous math teacher in middle school. Great. Um, had him for both seventh and eighth grade, Mr. Fisher. Shout out to Mr. Fisher, <laughs> he was fantastic. Um, he joked with my mom when I got an A in eighth grade math, whatever that was. Um, or no, my mom joked with him, what is this A? Is this A for abducted? Did Kate get abducted by aliens and suddenly became good at math? So. Mahoney humor. For sure. I, uh, I've not been a, math was my Achilles heel. I, um, I always struggled with math. I never excelled in math. I was always in, always in the bottom class for math, but um, had good teachers along the way. So I had Mr. Fisher in middle school and then it was, Pre-algebra, ninth grade, is that possible? Or algebra one? Yeah. Then geometry. Yeah. Yep. Then geometry. Then I don't know. I think it, it might have been pre-algebra or geometry. It's so funny. You're not the first person I've interviewed who doesn't remember their math classes they took. No. It shows you like <laughs> if you can't remember the classes we took, were they that good of classes? You know what I mean? Like were oh, they no. I've been thinking about this. <laughs> not gonna do. But I ended up, my final year of high school was pre-calc and it was a lost cause. <laughs> I, <laughs> I really struggled in pre-calc. And then in college, um, I think this is a fun tidbit, um, Muhlenberg required everyone to fulfill a reasoning requirement, which was the math requirement. Um, but I ended up being able to take a philosophy class. <laughs> And it was actually logic. It was yeah, Maddie said he took logic too. Yeah, P and Q's, P and Q, yeah. not Q equals not P. Right. Stuff like that. Yeah. If this, then that, and like Venn diagrams and figuring mm -hmm. out, like deconstructing arguments almost. And it, but it was mathematical and fulfilled my math requirement. And, well, it sounds it, like for you, Kate, is, instead of your senior year taking pre-calculus, you would have been better off taking some sort of data analysis class, right? Where like. Yeah. Learned how to use spreadsheets and just like if you knew it's like you don't need trigonometry it's like I'm probably going into history or something you're still going to need a data analysis class so that's or personal important. finance I mean right something like finance that. math and I would have so much I would I think everyone would benefit from that <laughs> yeah maybe a combination of the two yeah but uh, no that, that's great it's great to hear from somebody who's like yeah I did I was not great at math yeah thank you Mike. So, I mean, we went to the same high school, so the usual set, um, the algebras, the geometry, the pre-cal, I actually took statistics as well. I took a personal finance class in high school too. Like I mentioned, I did pre-cal again in college and then calc one, two, and three. Um, but I mean, being a technology degree, <clears throat> it's a lot of math, math, it's very math centric. So it was pretty important. I was always pretty good at it. I'm probably one of those students that teachers tend to hate. So I would get A's and B's on quizzes and tests and figure during lessons, I figured it out. So what was the point of homework? Please do your homework. I learned <laughs> it, it counts for a whole lot, uh, but it always came pretty easy to me. So it was something I leaned into pretty hard and kind of excelled and enjoyed. Uh, that's great. Now, do you guys uh, use calculus at all? <laughs> So yeah, like I said, I mean, I may not be using calculus per se, but I'm using the critical thinking skills I learned while learning calculus every every day, every meeting, kind of a thing. 
Uh, I barely got through pre-calc. <laughs> so, I would say you guys are using algebraic skills for sure. Like you have a problem that you need to solve. You need to find a solution to. We, we have some variables at play and you're analyzing those variables. Mikey, you're going even further. Uh, you're probably looking at things that are calculus related like growth rates and, and looking at, and you did too, Kate, you're looking at the growth rate of uh, people who are participating in your, in your book program and stuff like that. So it's actually calculus in nature, even though you don't know it. Um, well, let's, uh, let's finish it off before you guys ask me questions. Uh, could you go back in time to when you were a high school student, say you're a senior and you're like right where my students are, they're, they're, applying to colleges, they're getting accepted into colleges. Could you give yourself one piece of advice uh, looking back now that you wish you, you knew back then or that you followed back then? Yeah, so I mean, I wanna... like I mentioned before, I would have gone back to my former self and kind of said, you know, actually go ahead and do that homework, like lean into these things. Sure, you learned it right off the bat, but get better at it. There's always some way to improve. So I never really took the um, what are they called the top class courses, the AP classes like I never enrolled into them I kind of wish I had just to keep kept pushing I got comfortable with where I was and sat there and kind of stuck with it um, but rather than I wish I could have pushed myself further to learn more learn faster and just keep moving rather than going at a slower pace or the usual pace if that didn't really apply to me so it's like you have the strength you can do it push yourself when you know you can right if I can pitch a fastball for 80 miles an hour and just stop there, if I could get to 90, 100, maybe I can make a career out of this kind of a thing, right? So just you because anyway, others. You did anyways, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> it worked out in the long run. What about you, Kate? Um, the one thing that keeps coming to my mind is um, just believe in yourself. It sounds cheesy, but I feel like I still struggle with this a little bit. I'm, I'm better than I used to be, but I, I doubted myself a lot. And... Um, like it came down to like answering questions on final exams or you know AP exams, you name it. I would second guess myself and then get the question wrong. Like my gut was always nine times out of ten was right. right. And I think if I just trusted myself and didn't doubt myself so much, it would have taken me less time to get to where I wanted to be. You know, like I don't know, just believe in yourself. Yeah, and believe in your ability. To students who could use that advice. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to piggyback off that, because that was the other thing I was going to say is, related to what I was saying before, is don't be afraid of challenges and don't get comfortable, right? Just keep pushing, look for the things that are not comfortable. There's always something new to learn there. As you go through things, there'll be lessons you don't realize at the moment in time. So I've had part-time jobs from the age of 16 all the way through oh, yeah. college. Um, sure, I learned how what customer service is and how to be a cashier, but what I think I've also learned from all those different experiences and different jobs was being able to talk to people and getting to relate to people and having a conversation, um, which I think has helped me tremendously in all my jobs now. So it wasn't anything I thought I was learning at the time, but it just kind of built on itself and kept it going. And I know one of our friends' favorite movies is League of Their Own. And not to spoiler alert, but toward the end, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, it, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard's what makes it great. So if you're going to go through challenges, it's going to be tough. You're going to come out the other side of it, though. And failure is okay, too. We all fail every day. It's just a way to build up that muscle and get better at it and do bigger and better things. So don't get comfortable and just keep pushing yourself would be my biggest piece of advice. Can I just piggyback on? I to double piggyback. I totally, I totally agree with um, like taking every experience for what it's worth because it, on the face of it, it might feel like, like a job might just feel like oh, a job. I don't really want to do this, but you may be gathering skills that you can use later. And yeah, be, uh, I, I just guess to piggyback on that, just be, be open to everything because similarly, I had customer service jobs during college and Wow, they've really informed my public librarian service to the public, like, or my ability to serve the public in my role now. And um, I had no idea that that would be the case. That's awesome. Yeah, Mikey, I was really thinking, uh, where's he going to go with this league of their own? I was thinking, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's some other quotes I'm not going to bring into here, but yeah. We're put the oh, costumes think, uh, something, Jimmy Dugan. Anyways, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll watch it later. Uh, but, uh, 
thank you guys so much for that. I think it was great advice, great words of wisdom. Do you guys have any questions for me in like education these days? Um, or we can end things there. I know, Mikey, you have something to get to. Yep. I have a question and I'm, it's been percolating, so this is the first time I'm voicing it. But I wonder, as a, you as a teacher, if you have a perspective on um, collaborations between um, people like, like yourself and um, more informal educators, if you see a lot of that, if you think there could be more of that, like I consider myself an, an educator as well, just mm -hmm. not as formally, like I'm not in a classroom every day. Do you think there could be more collaboration between people like us or do you see a role for the public library more in schools or like, I don't know. I, a great question. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, you know, I like, think a lot of like, this is my first like outreach into uh, the real world, besides like my own personal anecdotes that I, that I bring to my classroom. And I always tell kids, it's like, you're not gonna use this class. Like 90% of you aren't gonna use calculus when you get to the real world. Uh, you will be using spreadsheets and data analysis though. Um, I, I, I do think it's probably easier for smaller schools. We are, we are a school, we have 3,700 kids in our high school and uh, just like scaling things and your, our classes are very large for a public, for a high school class, like 30, 30 kids, you know, in each class. So I think it's just as difficult to, to do those tie-ins. It's, it's tough even to combine a physics class and a calculus class, you know, so um, there's obviously room for more but I don't see it uh, progressing very quickly. We've talked about before, uh, there's a lot of lags in education with the real world. So that's one of them. So maybe public libraries can start filling small gaps. Who knows? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, I guess my question coming from, I know you came from a finance background too, is what's the most fun you have now in your current job and current role as a teacher? Uh, you know, it's whatever you make of it, teaching. I, I love, what I love about teaching in my role, like I'm the only AB calculus teacher and there's only one other calculus teacher. It's like, I get to do everything. So I get to create a class. I get to change it year to year. Um, I love the interactions with the students, how you have a new set of students. They always keep you on your toes. I always get kind of like, you know, Mikey, you probably know them you think like everybody thinks of me as like competitive, but I don't really like necessarily competition, but I like the games right. and kind of the adrenaline rush from playing games and, and teaching gives me that kind of adrenaline rush where you have to be on your top of your game at all times. And I'm always looking at continuously improving things that I do and giving my kids a better experience each year. Um, so that that's the stuff that I really love. Awesome. Thank you guys. You can tell in the background that uh, the kids are getting restless. So <laughs> back to them. But uh, Kate Mahoney, Michael Mulchark, my good friends, thanks for joining me in Mr. Messner's Math Speaker Series. Take care. We really appreciate uh, it. Similar, similar to Maddie, if anyone wants to reach out to us, feel free to pass around our contact info. I will. I will share it with you. Thanks, cool. guys. Take care, Take care everyone.